We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, look at who I have again. Joining us today is Dr. M. David Litwa. I'm excited about today's show. We're going to be covering a topic that we haven't actually discussed at all uh, yet. And I just want to give you guys a little bit of background of his expertise. It's in Greco-Roman religions, Philonic studies, Gospels and Pauline literature, heresiology, Gnostic and Nagamati studies, ancient philosophy, ancient mythology, deification, theosis, ancient esoteric movements, in particular Greek mystery cults, ruler worship. And he is a scholar of ancient uh, Mediterranean religions with a focus on the New Testament and early Christianity. Um, Dr. Litwell, welcome to Myth Vision. Hey, great to be back, Derek. Thanks so much. Good to see you. Thank you. I want everyone to know they can go right now and check out your books down in the description, Becoming Divine, an introduction to deification in Western culture. We're going to find out more about what that is all about. Also, Desiring Divinity, Self-Deification and Early Jewish and Christian Myth-Making. I mean, I can't recommend these books enough. If you can afford them, I highly recommend them. This is serious scholarship. Also, the book, uh, The Evil Creator, which I've been reading today. It is, I can't even begin. You're going to see that at some point in the next video. We're going to be discussing this a little bit further in depth. If you haven't joined the Patreon, consider doing so. I've got tons and tons of videos on Myth Vision's Patreon. And there's going to be a Christian, uh, Christmas Christian <laughs> Christmas webinar um, with Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, and I might be hosting that webinar for him. That'll be coming December. So go down in the description, December 5th. We're going to be doing an all-day webinar. Uh, join us through that link, and it helps us out a lot. All right, Dr. Litwa, what are we going to be talking about today? And have I missed anything in the introduction? No, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to see Ehrman's going to ruin Christmas again this year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So today I'll be talking about two books, um, one being Becoming Divine, the one on your screen here, and the other being Desiring Divinity. And these are the two books that introduce the concept of deification, which means most simply becoming a god or a divine being, or transforming from a human to a divine being. and this idea um, is maybe not too well known to your uh, viewers, but when you look at Western culture, and I define Western culture pretty broadly, um, this idea shows up again and again in history. People have this desire to become something greater than themselves. And the model for understanding something greater than humanity has been God, traditionally. Even in so-called the big three monotheistic faiths, you've got this desire to become one with God or to uh, assimilate to a divine identity, become for Christians in Christ, as Christ, in Christ's image, because we already start out, as it were, in God's image. And the end goal process is to become simply God. Some have called it the essence of sin, others the depth of salvation. This is really the tension in deification discourse. Basically, I'm sure your listeners might be familiar with the story of the Garden of Eden, where the very first promise to humanity from the snake is, eat from the fruit and you shall be as gods. Ironically, although many in the Protestant tradition view this as essentially arrogant and prideful, um, those in Eastern traditions of Christianity, such as Eastern Orthodoxy, including Greek and Russian Orthodoxy, have always have, have basically hold deification or sometimes called theosis as the Orthodox position. Um, that is just what Christian salvation means. Um, just to give a quick description of the book, though, regardless of one's evaluation of deification throughout Western history, it has been part of human aspiration. 
you can go back all the way to the ancient pharaohs to modern transhumanists, and you'll see that people have envisioned their own divinity. These visionaries are not only history's greatest megalomaniacs, but also mystics, sages, apostles, prophets, magicians, bishops, philosophers, atheists, monks, and some normal people, I would say. Some aimed to be independent gods, others realized their eternal union with God. Some anticipated godhood in heaven, others walked as gods on earth. Some accepted divinity by grace, others achieved it by their own will to power. I emphasize there's just no single form of deification. In fact, there's since there's no single conception of God, we wouldn't expect there to be one single idea of deification. Instead, there's many types of deification united by interlocking themes. Um, these themes for me include achieving deathlessness, wielding superhuman power, and assimilating to specific deities. And through these uh, moments, as it were, transcending normal, at least uh, earthly or human nature. So that's what this book is about. That's Becoming Divine is an, inter is an introduction. And it, it raises the question for me, and perhaps for some of your listeners, what do we mean by God anyway? Um, there's, depending on the culture, uh, the understanding of a God could be radically different. I read an interesting article the other day by Justin L. Barrett asking, is Santa Claus a God? Um, and, you know, <laughs> how would we know? Um, what are the criteria? And for me, uh, just quickly for your viewers, uh, I'm chiefly interested in ancient Mediterranean concepts of God. And I think that although the definitions are complex, we can narrow it down to more or less three, well, two basic traits, and then uh, a third element. A god is a being who is, first of all, not subject to death or corruption. Um, corruption being ending in, in death, that is, not subject to the laws of entropy, not growing old, etc. Second, a a god is a being who displays, who has, and who presents, that is, superhuman power. Um, and basically, that power can be manifested in a variety of ways. Um, it's not just raw force. Power can also be beauty, as in, you know, beauty has the power to entice and to, with beauty, you can control people because people have desires. Um, this would also include superhuman knowledge, the ability to prognosticate, to know the future. It would also include superhuman goodness or love or authority. Um, power is a pretty flexible term, but the key here is that it has to be superhuman power. That is, it has to be beyond the range of any normal human capabilities, by which we mean something above, say, you know, an Olympic runner might break a record in you know the hundred meter dash, but superhuman power means that you go beyond what any Olympic athlete could ever help, hope to achieve. Uh, so that that superhuman is is important. Um, so the first thinker that I looked I look at is actually a guy in ancient Egypt because all of this seems to start there. And this particular fellow is known as Amenhotep III. He's the father, if your viewers know a little bit about ancient Egyptian kings, he's the father of Akhenaten, the famous so-called first monotheist. And he's also the grandfather of uh, the much better known King Tut, whose gold flesh is uh, shown here. Um, What's interesting about Amenhotep, it's, it's not that he's unique among uh, Egyptian pharaohs entirely, but he uh, really takes his own divinity seriously. And we see uh, some standard elements, and we also see some unique elements with, with him. As some of your viewers might know, Egyptian kings were viewed as incarnations of a deity. Um, in Amenhotep's case, um, there was a backstory invented that uh, a god impregnated his mother, uh, 
hmm. a woman by the name a woman by the name of Mutim Ria, and she uh, was said to basically uh, interact by contact with a divine power, giving birth to Amenhotep the third. But normally, those kinds of backstories aren't needed. Normally, the Egyptian king or pharaoh is at his coronation united with a divine power called the Ka. And this power or energy, divine energy, is renewed at festivals. Um, the annual festival that I study is called the Apet Festival. Uh, but in the unique case of Amenhotep, he actually makes permanent the divine energies after 30 years in what's called the, the Sed Festival. So it's as if the king, the king's power or energy wanes over time, and it is periodically renewed. In Amenhotep's case, it becomes uh, permanent. Now, this divine element, the Ka, is eternal. You can think of it as the, the divine double of the king. Uh, it is united with the king. And when the king's body dies, this Ka, or his Ka, basically his inner self, then unites with the sun god. And so Amenhotep is still very much alive today, uh, if if you're totally buying into Egyptian uh, theology. Um, he never died. And that is the <laughs> mortal, immortal element. So you might, you know, go check out a mummy of a pharaoh. That's not the actual pharaoh. Uh, the actual pharaoh is uh, somewhere in, in the sky, somewhere united with the sun. Now, this idea of divine assimilation is picked up by the Greeks. Um, one of my favorite coins here is Alexander the Great with the horns, as you can see, of the god Amon, who is actually a, an Egyptian deity. Uh, but he's identified with um, Zeus. When we get to the age of Jesus, um, we see the Roman emperors right around the time of Jesus inherited what was thought to be a kind of superhuman power because it was literally a worldwide power that had never been seen before. Um, they literally ruled the known world. And emperors had what was called a divine self, somewhat similar to the Ka, but called the Genius. Um, and this is viewed as an eternal divine being. And this is the being that is worshipped at Roman altars, even while the emperor is alive. It is the divine double of the emperor. The emperor is divine by virtue of being somehow united to his genius. The rulers associate themselves, interestingly, to specific deities based on dominant traits. So um, a very famous marble sculpture here of the emperor Commodus, who has assimilated to a very specific god who is uh, Heracles or Hercules uh, with his club and his lion skin armor and holding his, in his hands, incidentally, are apples, which uh, are from the Hesperides um, and signify life. And so you have those three elements. Again, the power, the uh, assimilate, to, you have the power, you have the immortality, um, these Roman emperors, when they die, or when they died, the good ones at least, had an elaborate funeral ceremony where their inner self was released quite literally as an eagle. They built a huge pyre that is a, essentially a three-story, kind of almost like a cake, a wedding cake, sort of a pyre, but made of wood, obviously, filled with perfumes. And the wax body of the emperor melted on top of this pyre. And after the wax body melted, an eagle from behind the pyre was released, signifying the uh, release of the emperor's soul into, into heaven. So they very much thought that these beings were deathless and immortal. And they also had this fascination with assimilating them to particular divine beings. Now, wow. What I do, what I do, uh, by the way, I should say, you can stop me at, at, at any time. <laughs> no, I, 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 there's so many questions. I don't even want to, I, I just, I think it's better that the professional takes us through what's going on. 
Okay. Well, basically, the, the overarching arc, narrative arc of the book is that this deification, which is first established for rulers, becomes democratized, that is made available for also other people. Um, there's a famous saying of, of Nietzsche, uh, which I quote in the book, and Nietzsche was very frustrated that deification started um, becoming available for other people, and particularly resentful that a Jewish peasant from Nazareth could also uh, get the benefits of deification. And Nietzsche complained that now deification is basically for every Peter and Paul, as we might say, for every Tom, Dick, or Harry, and he was not very happy about that. One of the persons who made that possible was none other than Paul of Tarsus, and he is also gets a chapter in this book. As some of your viewers will know, uh, Paul has this concept of a divine spirit in Greek, a, a pneuma, which unites with the believers in baptism. This is a divine and immortal element that is basically ab absorbed into the believer and immortalizes the believer from within. Um, he says that believers in Jesus will rise in deathless bodies, what he actually calls soma pneumatica or somata pneumatica. And these bodies are basically spirit bodies that don't die. Um, we don't know exactly what they look like, uh, but they're not normal human flesh because flesh and blood, as he says, don't inherit the kingdom of God. Humans also, according to Paul, inherit superhuman power to judge angels and to rule the world. Uh, this is what he says anyway to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Won't we judge angels? And uh, also he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 21, we, uh, all things are yours, whether death or life and so on and so forth. And this idea of cosmic ownership and cosmic rule is something that is made possible by assimilation to now a, a specific divine being, uh, Jesus or Paul preferred Christ. And this being, as your viewers well know, uh, as, and as Paul himself said, he received, um, after his resurrection, he became son of God in Romans 1, 3, and mm. uh, by virtue of him rising from the dead. Yep. And that is a promise, not just for Christ, but for Paul, everybody, everybody who wants to conform to Christ. And that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate principle of democratization. That is, because of this, now deification is available to everybody. And where I um, make this argument at length is in a book called We Are Being Transformed. Uh, this is actually my very first book in 2012. And this is where I go uh, in the course of 300 pages and, and walk you through that. Um, so um, in this, I've, I've also made freely available on my uh, academia.edu uh, site. So you, you don't have to pay for this one, um, unless of course you, you want to support the, the publisher. Um, just to go through the other chapters in the Becoming Divine book, um, I look at the Mithras liturgy or so-called Mithraism. This is actually not uh, totally Mithraic. This, is, this chapter focuses on a particular magic spell, which we have in the Greek magical papyri, wherein the magician is immortalized. Uh, I also look at the Hermetic literature. If, if some of your viewers are familiar with ancient Hermetic literature, that is also uh, a, a more esoteric sort of Egyptian philosophy in the time of Christianity. Uh, that also has a theory of deification. I look at Plotinus, who's a, who's a late Platonist, so-called the first Neoplatonist, and then Augustine, as some of your readers, or some of your viewers, that is, will, will know. Then I look at a, an Islamic thinker, Hussein ibn Mansur al halaj who, because of radical monotheism, also thought that he was identified with God. Meister Eckhart, 
um, a very famous Christian medieval thinker, Gregory Palamas, who sorts of sets the tone for orthodoxy, uh, that is um, Eastern Orthodoxy. Martin Luther, uh, the Protestant um, reformer. Then I look at Mormons, um, the theory of deification in, in Joseph Smith. Um, and the, the final chapter is uh, Nietzsche and uh, Zarathustra. There's a quick uh, postlude on the post-human God. This is, what I mean by this is that being who, as some of your uh, listeners might know, is a being who some people think that through technology, we can essentially transcend human human nature right now. Uh, it's not only through technology, we could do it through gene therapy, uh, we could do it through gene modification. We could, people think about uploading our minds onto a supercomputer. Uh, people talk about um, getting sort of downloaded into avatars uh, that live forever or downloading oneself into a super body made of silicon, which can doesn't decay. This is what I mean by uh, the, the sort of post-human God. These these radical uh, transhumanist visions of becoming divine that are basically becoming more and more popular. A simple internet search will, will show you that. So that's uh, becoming divine. And the, uh, the question that it raises is how, how does one actually become divine? And that's the uh, inquiry that I make in the next book that I'm going to discuss or just introduce for your uh, viewers today. But I should actually stop um, and just see if there's any, um, if you want to make me back up or have any kind of questions or comments because All I right. don't want I don't want to lose anybody. So I did. I, so I've got you up on the screen here, uh, just you and me. Uh, I can okay. always pop it back so that we could go back to the presentation. You don't have to close anything. A uh, couple questions. First of all, I think it's really interesting how clean and simple it is to point out that Paul saying flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. This is clearly a spirit body. I also think it's funny when you said Mithraic, like, like uh, th th this deification and that the magician became deified. W w does this have potentially any connection with Jesus being a magician? Uh, why he's constantly referred to as a magician or having magical powers and things like that, or well, if you're Morton Smith, and some of your some of your viewers might know Morton Smith, the, the famous so-called discoverer of secret mark, his theory was that Jesus was a magician and that he had a, a, a basically a baptismal rite in which the believer ascended to heaven and became a god. Uh, is similar to what we find in the Mithras liturgy, which is this magical text, probably of the second century, originally written in the second century. And it's in the Greek magical papyri. And in this magical text, basically you call upon Mithras, who is a sun god. And Mithras, through a series of rituals, gives you the ability to ascend into a sort of I mean, it's it's not, you go far beyond heaven because heaven for the ancients is a, a sort of seven layered zone. Mm -hmm. But you, you go into this essentially uh, new universe above heaven and you receive deification there and then you come back. And when you come back, you have all these divine powers and and energies. Um, but it, it's it's in a sense it's a it's a temporary immortalization. Um, you you could view it as the immortalization as your essential part, as as your true self, however you conceive of your true self, and then that true self comes back and inhabits your body, and all of a sudden you are, as it were, energized with with divine power. Um, so so whether Jesus was involved in any kind of those those rituals, I I don't know. Right. Um, but, but those rituals are attested about a century after him. And, and that's what the Mithras liturgy is. Final question, then, I guess, and I'd love to keep moving. Uh, everything you said was really interesting, and it makes me kind of want to put some puzzle pieces together. But 
I, being someone who's had my experience with drugs in my life, and it's not just bad drugs, right? Uh, I've mm-hmm. sampled plenty of things in my life, and <laughs> one of those things were hallucination. You know, I had, I've had, I've taken some things that have taken me what seems to be out of this reality and potentially beyond the heavens. All right, to another place. Um, you hear a lot of people who describe this this uh, experience as something like that. Do you think that in these deification rites, oftentimes in mystery schools and such, they are ingesting some type of honey laced drink or some they're smoking something, they're eating something, they're drinking something that is causing them to potentially go through this rite in a, uh, I guess, a ceremonial sense, not necessarily like people today sitting on their couch, just watch, let's trip, bro. I'm going to go on a trip, man. No, no, no. Like, like legitimately taking it in a ceremonial sense, like a shaman would. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, The Mithras liturgy um, uh, is, has a recipe for, uh, it's a little bit funny. It's essentially a recipe for what might be called beetle juice or the the scarab beetle juice, (laughs) because the scarab beetle was a sign for the sun God um, that it, because it, it rolled its own, its dung into a ball and and sort of pushed that along, which reminded the Egyptians of the movement of the sun throughout the sky. So you you take a scarab, uh, and which is a kind of beetle, and use a bunch of other ingredients, and you make what's called or what I'm what I'll just call a, a beetle juice, and you are ingesting that in in the ritual because you want to identify with the sun god. Ah. Um, the only thing there is, though, I don't think that anything in that recipe has any hallucinogenic qualities. I may be wrong. Obviously, I haven't taken it. <laughs> <laughs> but right. but um, what's interesting about the human mind is um, given, and this is also very true in hermetic literature, it can enter into transcendent states without necessarily in ingesting any uh, mind-altering substance. Um, through the process of uh, meditation, um, you can enter into basically transcendent or if you prefer trance states, mm-hmm. and there are techniques to, to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I the, the short answer is I don't think there's anything hallucinogenic involved. Um, I think that they, I, and I, I do think that they had something, a, a very realistic experience, um, but I'd love to be corrected on that point. Um, I, you know, hire, a, uh, get in here an expert on ancient hallucinogens. I'd love to hear it myself. <laughs> yeah, same here. Um, yeah, and there is the placebo effect as well. So yeah. there's that that um, power of suggestion based on the ritual and the senses that are being utilized in the process. I can imagine invoking yourself becoming divine. It's got to be a deep, extremely significant uh, uh, m- mindset to even think I am going to be God. You know, like that's powerful to even mm-hmm. think of, you know, especially if you put yourself into that kind of uh, frame of mind. So thank you so much. If you'd like to continue, I can. Sure. OK. Yeah. So be- desiring divinity is 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 answers that question. How how does one become a god? It, it's not a manual, of course, but it looks at ancient thinkers who uh, through the process of of uh, well, it's a variety of processes, but it's mostly cognitive processes who envisioned their own divinity and for themselves became um, divine beings. Um, a couple quotes here just to, to meditate on, um, whether or not they're true or not, I'm not vouching for their truth, but they're they're interesting to think with. Um, Bertrand Russell, famous early 20th century uh, British atheist, said that every man, and in modern days, we might say every person would like to be God if it were possible. Some few find it difficult to admit the impossibility. There's a little bit of a, <laughs> a joke there. Um, <clears throat> the other, the other quote uh, 
interesting quote I find, found when researching this was from Albert Camus, who wrote a, a very nice essay called The Rebel. And in it, he wrote, um, quote, it, it no longer suffices for the rebel to declare himself God or to look to his own salvation by adopting a certain attitude of mind. The species must be deified as Nietzsche attempted to do, and his ideal of the Superman must be adopted so as to assure salvation for all. Hmm. Unquote. Now, there's a certain danger here, of course, and, and there's a, there's danger throughout all of this that people are always going to be pointing the finger and saying that, that this is terribly, terribly arrogant stuff and terribly dangerous. Uh, but we'll see. One of the interesting things that I found in this is that it's a sort of yes and no, both and kind of thing. Um, one can define self deification really easily. It's just making of oneself into a god, uh, whether ontologically or rhetorically. Um, and we see this a lot sort of in, in politics. Um, we see it quite literally in, in, in North Korea mm -hmm. um, with uh, the Kim family. Um, occasionally, we see it even in, in, in American politics. I remember when Obama was running, people were saying that he he's as, as popular as, as a god, as it were. And uh, as, as is well known, political leaders sometimes um, certainly in ancient times, morphed themselves with divine uh, images and imagery, and uh, sometimes were viewed as as literal as literal divine beings. And that's something a little bit hard to get one's head wrapped around, but that still does um, exist. Mm. What I found, though, was that when looking at the, the different mythologies of people who became gods, there are basically two patterns that I found. Um, one is that the, the self-deifier is a positive being, that is a, a, a hero. Uh, I, I wrote here angel, but basically a positive being. Mm -hmm. and, and the other is that the, the, the sort of more familiar pattern, probably to your viewers, is, is the self-deifier as, as a rebel. Because the self-deifier has to be involved in an amazing task of self-assertion. They have to actually believe that they are a divine being, and that can sound very, very scary. Um, if we look at the self-deifier as a rebel, the three figures that I looked at were um, what I call the primal human or Adam, uh, Hallel, uh, sometimes called Lucifer, sometimes called Satan, and the evil creator that is held about in, in Gnostic or Sethian literature. Um, the primal human is, I don't go to Genesis 3 for this, I actually go to a, a chapter of the Bible that maybe some of your viewers aren't familiar with, which is Ezekiel 28. And Ezekiel 28 is the description of a myth that seems to be older than what we find in Genesis 3. And this is the description of a, a being who appears to be the first human, but is also an angelic figure studded with gems and walking in the paradise of God, who then experiences a tremendous fall. And uh, that seems to be, it, the idea seems to be that humans were originally divine beings existing in a kind of, uh, divine realm and who underwent some sort of tragic mistake that's the first chapter the second chapter looks at lucifer um this text focusing on isaiah 14 which is our first text actually talking about this being called the shining one hallel in hebrew who tries to raises his throne above the stars of God and again experiences a huge uh, fall. And finally, Yaldabaoth, uh, the final rebel. This one is interesting because in the previous examples, you have the Hebrew God trying to put down basically a rebel figure. But in, in Gnostic literature, this is inverted so that actually the Hebrew God is himself the rebel. Um, and he himself, the creator himself, is the evil one. And there's someone, a god above him, hmm. that he doesn't even know about. And so the, 
this is the interesting inversion where he's been Yald Yahweh or Yaldabaoth has been trying to keep down rebels in his mini kingdom, but he's actually much part of a much, much larger universe in which he himself is a rebel against a much greater divine power. But the other pattern that I found, and this to me was the more interesting pattern, was sometimes in this in mythology, the self deifier is also a hero. And the examples that I use here are the one and only Jesus, Simon of Samaria, sometimes wrongfully called Simon Magus, uh, Allogenes, who is a figure in, in Gnostic literature. Um, as is well known, uh, extremely well known to you, um, Jesus does claim divinity. I think he claims divinity in all four Gospels, but the one that most people agree on is <laughs> he, he, he claims divinity in the Gospel of John with his I am sayings, with his uh, claim to be older than Abraham, with his claim to uh, say that I and the Father are one, um, with his claim that uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so the, the question is, this isn't about going back to the historical Jesus and, and figuring out whether he actually said those things. This is about why Christians in later literature depicted Jesus as a self-deifying being. In other words, a being who claimed his own divinity and who didn't get struck down, unlike Lucifer, who got risen up after he claimed his own divinity. That's the big surprise. The other figure that I look at is uh, Simon of Samaria. Um, and he's another very famous early Christian self-deifier. I say he's the hero, or I should say, in very specific texts, the, the Acts of Peter and what are called the Pseudo-Clementines, which are fourth century, early fourth century Christian novels. Simon is portrayed as leader of one of the earliest Christian groups. And interestingly enough, it's Peter, the apostle Peter, who has to chase Simon around the Mediterranean and try to counteract his influence, which indicates to me, uh, this isn't history, of course, but it's interesting that in the representation of the imagination, Simon is the first Christian evangelizing the world, and that Peter has to essentially nip at his heels and follow after him. And Simon has his own group, has his own form of Christianity, is very successful, he performs miracles and uh, the Levant that is in, in Palestine and in Syria, and then he goes to Rome. May I and, may I ask you something on this? This is a very interesting uh, part. Okay, sure. So uh, I have a dear friend, Dr. Robert M. Price, and he has this idea where he thinks that Simon of Samaria may be a pseudonym or potentially may be the Apostle Paul. Um, there seems to be in the Acts of the Apostles, this Simon figure who's trying to buy the Holy Spirit. And he thinks this is a jab at Simon of Samaria, where Peter's saying, no, you're not buying the Holy Spirit. What do you think? No. You know, and he condemns him and he's like, please, no, show mercy to me, which is clearly like showing Peter's power. But why he kind of does this connection, maybe to get your thoughts, this might, he might be over parale uh, paralleling here. But he thinks that there's something to it because Paul in his own letters says, look, we had an agreement. As long as I give them money, as long as I'm feeding the poor, as long as I'm paying them, there's a stamp on my gospel. And he thinks there's just like it's maybe a little bit of a conspiracy theory, but that there might be this uh, issue going on where <laughs> this Simon and, and Paul and, and issue with Peter plays a role do you think it's possible or what, like what is there anything to this in your head well i think that in terms of the historical imagination the the christian imagination christian construction of simon of samaria was also influenced by the portrait of paul in acts but i think ultimately paul and simon of samaria are two different historical figures who lived in the first century What's interesting about both is that, yes, they both seem to have come into conflict conflict with Peter, or at least they are represented as doing that. Um, Paul's famous uh, spat with Peter, he says, took place in Antioch, and he talks about it in Galatians 2. And later, of course, in when Acts 
uh, finally gets written, I think, uh, in, around 140-ish in the second century. Simon also is portrayed as having a spat with Peter. And uh, what's interesting, what's more interesting to me is what the author of Acts admits about Simon. Um, he admits that Simon is a baptized Christian. And this is important because other Christians tried to de-Christianize Simon and say, oh, well, he's not even a Christian, he's a heretic. Wrong, he was a baptized Christian. When he's rebuked by Peter, which when you read it, and I encourage all your viewers to read Acts chapter 8, Peter just seems like he's uh, a little bit oversensitive. Uh, all that Simon asked was to be able to transmit the spirit by means of human touch. And Peter just goes way overboard and calls him a bunch of names. And instead of stomping off and, you know, swearing at him, Simon, as you know, uh, very obsequiously repents. So there's no question of Simon's Christian identity. Um, and I think that identity is different enough from Paul. It's interesting when you read the Acts of Peter, Paul is also a character in the Acts of Peter. Paul shows up first going to Rome, then he ends up going to Spain, and then Simon comes right after Paul, and then finally Peter comes and tries to counteract Simon. So they're they're viewed as they're viewed as different characters in in early Christian literature. Um, I think what Robert Price is is sort of leaning on is mostly the pseudo-Clementine literature, because there was a very famous hypothesis about the pseudo-Clementine literature that Simon was a stand-in for Paul. And I do agree that in terms of how Simon is envisioned, in terms of the historical imagination, you have to remember that the pseudo-Clementines are fourth century, that is mm. 300 years after Simon. So it's, it's essentially like the fiction has gotten a bit wacky at this point, <laughs> but they have envisioned Simon sometimes doing, saying things that Paul might say. So that's true. This law free gospel business, that sounds like Paul, but basically in the early Christian imagination, Simon and Peter were also viewed as entirely distinct characters. So um, I'm, I, I wouldn't vouch for any kind of conspiracy in, in, in the literature. Sorry um, for the interruption. Does, I, no, no, no worries. Does that answer your, your or does that yeah, get at yeah. your question? That got, okay. You answered it, and it's just an interesting question. And uh, you were mentioned prior to this with Jesus' deification. This gets into the heart of, like, why was he actually crucified? And and I have a buddy uh, that, well, he's not on the Internet anymore, anymore, but he thinks that Jesus really did claim deification which is what got him in trouble according to my friend that's what they think so i, I it's there's a bunch of question marks over what happened for real but you know yeah i mean i think that's pretty well supported in the gospels in the synoptics he's asked that question by the high priest are you uh the son of the blessed one um or are you the messiah son of the blessed one and he says yes and you'll see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and it's pretty clear that he's identifying himself with that divine being called the son of man and that's what causes the high priest to freak out basically rip his tunic in shreds and bring him to the higher roman court because he took it i think as a claim to divinity. Now, again, that's separate from the historical question. That's mm -hmm. how Jesus's trial was portrayed 50 years after the trial took place. So we, we don't have any actual trial minutes, but it's interesting to think why in the late first century, yeah, Jesus does get crucified essentially for claiming to be a God. Um, whereas more historically, it was probably because he was just uh, causing a disturbance in the temple court uh, and the Romans just wanted to summarily get rid of anybody who looked even a little bit like a political disruptor. Again, scholars are going to disagree about this all the time. Um, but <laughs> um, the last figure that I look at um, is a figure called Alleghenies. Now, Alleghenies is, just means the stranger. Um, and this guy appears in Nagamati. Uh, Nagamati literature, if your viewers are familiar with this literature, it's it's uh, basically uh, was found in Egypt 
um, at the end of the Second World War and contains about 50 previously unknown Gnostic Christian texts. And one of them is called the stranger, sometimes the foreigner, that is Allegheny's. Allegheny's is sometimes identified with Seth, the son of Adam. But this particular Nagamati treatise talks about how he, through the power of meditation, through the power of self-knowledge, actually rises sort of internally, sort of through his mind into the, the transcendent realm and experiences his own divinity. And he also is a hero. He's never thrown down. He, he, in fact, he's quite humble about everything. He is an amazing model for how the Celtifier can end up achieving that goal and actually being praised for it by the supreme deity. So to kind of sum up what self-deification involves, the first thing I would say is it involves a, a perception of one's own innate divinity. And, and this has been conceived of in so many different ways. Uh, but that's the basic general way of talking about it. And then a practice of reflexivity. Um, this could be anything, but from meditation to self-writing to something, any activity that involves deeper knowledge of the self, developing deeper knowledge of the self that helps one develop that inner sense of divinity. And then finally, identification with what I call the finalized self, or what one could imagine as the divine double who's imagined as a divine being or God. This pattern does recur in the history of religion, and it occurs in many figures. And it's not only rebels, it's heroes like Jesus who go through this process and end up being exalted and vindicated after they're, they're condemned. I just throw in here a, a quick quote from the Gospel of Eve, which is one of the many lost Gospels from which we have just fragments. And this one says, where the divine being is speaking to the Christian, I am you and you are I, wherever you are, there I am. I am sown in all people, wherever you want to gather me and gathering me, you gather yourself. Mm. There's also, uh, yeah, that famous saying in the Gospel of Thomas where Jesus says, you know, lift a rock, you'll find me, split a piece of wood, you'll find me, I'm everywhere, but especially inside of you. And this idea is really the sort of the seed of, uh, of, of self-deification. And I call these the, the three moments of, of self-deification. What it shows, I think, is that this is entirely a Christian idea. So very far from these, these people who want to immediately condemn deification as the essence of sin. When you look back into the tradition, when you look back into the mythology, the interesting thing is this is part of earliest Christian discourse. And if you switch over to... Eastern Orthodox tradition, this is still mainstream early Christian dis discourse. It might be condemned as heretical. It might have been condemned as heretical in, in the West, but in other traditions, it became the orthodoxy. Hmm. And so that's the that's the end of, of, of the show. Uh, <laughs> it's just really quite simple. Um, and... Uh, Basically, uh, that's a brief introduction to those two books, which I hope your 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 viewers, yeah, maybe if they have the time or energy, have had the chance to check out. Absolutely, I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, one of the things I guess I'm going to just give you my own little personal of you know I was a Christian, I was a hardcore fundamentalist. And over the years, you start finding out about mythology. You start finding out about errors, human error that mm -hmm. finds its way within the manuscript traditions. You start finding out a lot more things than you once knew. Mm -hmm. And I was dying. I was dying of heroin addiction. Um, I couldn't help but continue to inject heroin. I was stuck. And I remember I, I was literally like telling myself, I'm going to die. Like I started hearing it from people. I started waking up realizing I'm, this is it, my mortality. I'm, I'm done. And I remember being absolutely hopeless. And in that moment, like 
sure, I said a prayer. I mean, who wouldn't? Foxhole prayer type thing. But it was this gradual process that started to happen when I started to realize that it was me all along. So it kind of, for me, okay, someone watching this might be a theist and might have some other conclusion ontologically. But it was the people, the, the support that I had and the willingness that I had to actually change that that really did it for me. And I remember it was like I saw that two footprints in the stand thing with Jesus. And it's like, I carried mm -hmm. you. And uh, I remember hearing that and then thinking to myself, no, the reason you saw a set of footprints is because it was you the whole time walking. You just had your friend with you. You, you thought this this being God was with you, but really the whole time it was you. And so I feel like in a sense, it's kind of funny as an atheist, I'm, I'm, I'm technically what you would call a materialist. That doesn't mean I don't experience. That doesn't mean I don't profoundly experience just like everyone else. And I feel, and I love myth and I love this. And I think to myself, I had a sense of self deification from death. And I said, you can do it. And I helped other people do it too. And like, I feel like, I've created this little like I've mythologized just a human thing. I think we all experience in my own way to me. I didn't need uh, a name to it, though. It just was my own personal experience that I had escaping a serious traumatic situation. So I, I just wanted to couple it in. On to, <laughs> I know it wasn't, no. you know, and it depends on how you want to interpret it, Derek, because yeah. uh, one of the ways you could interpret it is that the reason you overcame that lethal exercise, that utter hopelessness that you experienced was because you have that higher self within you that refused to be dominated by drugs or dismal thoughts or whatever it may be, and you triumphed. And that divine spark, so to speak, that inner self, is that divine element of you, of you. Again, if it, it really, and, and, and the goal of life is sort of to develop that particular element. Um, right. And that's what, that's what deification is. It, it is, it has nothing to do with being arrogant. You know, again, deification, especially self deification is, is associated with these political rulers who are uh, like Trump or something who is, who is, probably, I don't know, a clinical narcissist. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Right. But it really has nothing to do with um, narcissism. It has nothing to do with, with pride. It's a very humble realization um, that is your, your own inner divinity. And that is, um, yeah, that's something to take with you if you, if, if you think that it's there. If, if you think that yeah, we're just uh, uh, flesh and bone. That's fine too. It's yeah. not that that inner self that you have, the true self, is isn't material. It can, it can be material, but we we need to envision materiality, a kind of materiality that is also divine. That is the kind of materiality that is like Paul's pneumatic body. It, it it's a it's physical. Um, it it really exists. You can touch it. Sometimes you can see it. It can exist in the upper reaches of the cosmos. Um, we can put it under a microscope and see what it looks like. Um, it's it's there. He thinks it's material, but it's also an entity that lives forever and that's super intelligent and so on and so forth. Hmm. It is interesting. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I've had discussions with people who are like actual um, spiritual minded people who think that this is a literal essence of some sort, literally in some physical way, or that there's a, a realm we just don't see, whatever. And they, they apply it and they say, well, I think we're, I think we're both drawing similar experience and trying to conclude the same thing without using the same language. Because even as someone like me who may not believe ontologically in the divine, literally, um, I see the use for these myths. I see the use for the practice of these things. And they have such a practicality 
that uh, I think it, it'd be silly to ignore them completely. And that's the problem with too many atheists, if you give my own personal opinion. They literally throw the baby out with the bathwater without seeing what's useful in the practicality of what's coming out of these things. So, I, of course, there's some things you want to get rid of. You know, look at the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, we're going to get to that in the next episode. But, you know, there's some things you want to go, yeah, that's just not a good thing to do or to practice, you know. But um, thank you so much for this. This is enlightening. I really look forward to reading your book and understanding how humans have, uh, you know, throughout history have used this idea and understood well, it's myth, and this is myth vision, so enjoy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to go and uh, check out uh, Bart Ehrman's webinar. I'll be hosting, hopefully, uh, looking forward to doing that. Because Bart Ehrman, you know, he's he's been showing up a lot more lately in, uh, in what we've been doing here uh, on myth vision. And I definitely hope you guys will check that out for sure. He's uh, he's. I don't know. He's been showing up a lot more. Let's put it that way. Go check out the Patreon as well. I just dropped this as well as other videos on the Patreon, and I'm continuing to do so. We also have the evil creator we're going to talk about next with Dr. Litwa, and he has Desiring Divinity we talked about today. we got to briefly just tease you into why you want to take a deep dive in his material, and trust me when I tell you, take my word when I tell you he knows how to grab you when he's writing. His writing is really well done and becoming divine if this episode touched you no matter what your ontology is uh i hope it did i hope you see something you could learn from all of this and consider getting the book this one's far more affordable becoming divine and uh if you can't afford the desiring divinity i understand at least you can get becoming divine get it on kindle paperback it seems even me and him were scratching our head before the show that there might even be a hard copy uh, <laughs> but we'll see. So, so be sure to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Litwa. I appreciate you. Thank you. Any final words? No, uh, you've done it, done it well. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. And never forget if you're trying to rise through the levels and become divine, you could say a little chant in the process. We are myth vision. <laughs> <laughs>